Hello viewers, we're going to talk today about carpal tunnel syndrome and this is a very, very, very important uh, disease entity disorder uh, that you will encounter because one, it is very frequent and two, it doesn't matter what your specialty is, you're going to see this in real life. Maybe if you're a neonatologist you might not see it, but you could work with a pediatric population, you could work with a, uh, an adult population, particularly if you work with an elderly population, you could work in surgery, you could work in OBGYN, you could work in, uh, in internal medicine, family practice. You may see or you will see or, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. So this is something that's very important to know about, know how to diagnose it, when to, uh, when to suspect it, how to diagnose it, when to treat it, how to treat it, and when to refer to our friendly orthopedic surgeon. 95% of carpal tunnel syndrome cases do not require surgery, so this is why it's very, very important to know the management behind this, and USMLE will expect you to know this. We'll do a quick anatomy review. The wrist is relatively intricate joint, so uh, I, I want you to know the eight carpal bones, uh, and then we'll talk about the uh, carpal tunnel syndrome in and of itself. So the motions of the wrist, because the carpals, because there's eight of them, because there's so many ligaments, and because this is going to be directly related to our hand, there are a lot of motions of the wrist, and that's a good thing because it allows us to manually manipulate uh, objects we come into contact with. So the first set of motions are flexion and extension, which you probably know that this is flexion and extension, but technically the definition of flexion is if you were to draw a line down a joint, 180 degrees, uh, flexion is anything that reduces that angle. And so if you're in anatomic position and you set that at 180 degrees, here you go, flexing, you're reducing that angle. And then here with extension, you're increasing that angle. Radial and ulnar deviation are pretty simple just based on how they're named. With radial deviation, you're deviating uh, the, the wrist uh, laterally to the radial side, the thumb side. With ulnar deviation, you're radiating, radiating it medially towards the pinky side. And then pronation and supination are just 180 degree rotations at the wrist, anterior to posterior directed rotations. And the way I like to tell people to remember this is that if you're holding a bowl of soup, you're in supinated position because you have to have your hand, your palms facing outwards to hold the, 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 uh, the bowl of soup. And then pronating would be with your hands lying flat, with your palms facing down. Okay, so pronation and supination. Okay, so these are the carpal bones, and they can be relatively confusing because their names are kind of, you know, they're... Their names don't really make any any sense. Uh, they just got their names from uh, who knows. Uh, but uh, it's going to be really important to remember these strangely named bones, uh, simply because when you read an x-ray, you're going to want to know if there's any kinds of fractures or anything else. We're not going to be talking about particularly wrist fractures here, but when we're talking about carpal tunnel syndrome, we're talking also about the carpal bones. And so I do want to introduce these carpal bones uh, just so we can be aware of them for the future. So I like to divide, there's eight carpal bones, and I like to divide these into two groups of four. And by doing that, it makes it a little bit easier to, uh, to sort of break these up and remember. So the two groups of four I break them up is proximal and distal. So here's your proximal four. Your, uh, and the proximal four are the four that are closer to your forearm, the ulna and the radius. And then your distal four are the four that come into contact with the metacarpals, which form your hand. So let's look at the proximal four. Now we're working here laterally to medially, because this is metacarpal one that's going to go to your thumb, and this is metacarpal five over here, which goes to your pinky. So this is medially, and this is lateral. So starting lateral, we've got the scaphoid, the lunate, the triquetral, and the pisiform. 
So those are your four proximal carpal bones. The four distal carpal bones are your trapezium, the trapezoid, the capitate, and the hamate. So the trapezium articulates, it comes into contact with metacarpal 1 and metacarpal 2. The trapezoid comes into contact with metacarpal 2. The capitate comes into contact both with metacarpal 2 and metacarpal 3. And the hamate comes into contact both with metacarpal 4 and metacarpal 5. And so if you're working in the direction that I showed you, going laterally to medially with those two groups, the, the proximal group and then the distal group, you can actually use this mnemonic, S-L-T-P-T-T-C-H. Sally lowers Tim's pants, then things can happen. That's kind of dirty. Or some lovers try positions that they can't handle. That's also kind of dirty. But you know what? If it works, it works. There's no rules for making mnemonics. If it works, it works. All right. So I would remember this. We're going to look at an x-ray now. Okay, so this is the exact same position uh, that we've got uh, from this. Uh, this is just an x-ray. And a lot of times when you're given an x-ray of a wrist, uh, you're going to be looking at it from this view, even though this isn't really an anatomic view, because remember, anatomically, your arms are going downwards. And here where we've got our hands facing upwards, but nevertheless, this is the view that you're going to most commonly see this in. So the first thing you want to do when you're looking at an x-ray of the wrist, and I will preface this with the fact that this wrist is normal, is you want to know what side is lateral and what side is medial. And by doing that, even though you can't see the rest of it here, this is the thumb. This will go to the thumb and this will go to the pinky. And remember, the thumb is always lateral and the pinky is always medial. So here's our metacarpals, one which would be the, towards the thumb, two, three, four, and five. So this is lateral and this is medial. And remember, working lateral to medial, we've got our scaphoid, lunate, triquetral, pisiform, and then the trapezium, the trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. So those are our eight carpal bones. There is a feature of the hamate that is, uh, it's not a bone, but it's a feature of the hamate on the surface of the hamate that's important just because of what it holds, and that's called the hook of the hamate. And so what you, you can't really see it here. It looks kind of almost just like a calcification, but this is actually a three-dimensional. It's, it's coming towards you. You just can't appreciate it on this two-dimensional x-ray because it only shows two dimensions. But it is kind of like a little hook. And this holds in place the flexor retinaculum, as well as a couple other structures which hold that in place. Uh, that's going to be important when we talk about what the carpal tunnel is. And then another important uh, landmark to remember is this sort of abyss of nothing between the trapezium, the scaphoid, and the very, very distal most part of the radius. And this is called the anatomical snuff box. And if you look at your thumb and you, I don't know, you kind of, uh, if you extend your thumb out, I, I don't know how to explain how to do the position, but you can see a little gap right at your wrist. That's your anatomical snuff box. Some people have a more, uh, have a more dominant looking one than others. But anyhow. Oh, and uh, just little uh, anatomy FYI quiz here. You know what this little thing is here? Coming off the ulna? What is this called? That's your styloid process. Okay, anatomy can be important, but don't bog yourself down too much with it. Okay, so what is the carpal tunnel? The carpal tunnel, in order for it to be a tunnel, it's got to be a three-dimensional space because up until now, we've only been talking about two dimensions. So when we think about this in three dimensions, we've got to have a floor, walls, and a, a ceiling, like any tunnel. And so the, the walls can be provided by our bones, and the floor can be provided by our bones, but then we need a we, we need a ceiling, and we don't have that with the bones because these bones aren't coming out and over each other. 
And so something needs to form that ceiling. And what does that is the transverse carpal ligament, also known as the flexor retinaculum. And so the flexor retinaculum extends from the hook of the hamate roughly uh, to the uh, trapezium. And uh, various structures are going to go through there, uh, and most of these structures are, uh, are ligaments, and they're flexor ligaments, because we're looking right now at the, uh, at the, the anterior, the palmar surface of the hand. So uh, there's... Also, though, most importantly, and most important when we're talking about carpal tunnel syndrome, is that there is one nerve that passes through the carpal tunnel, and that is the median nerve. There are also other nerves that go to the hand, but it's the, ul or the median nerve that passes through the carpal tunnel. The ulnar nerve passes around it, the radial nerve passes around it on the other side, but the median nerve passes through the carpal tunnel. And because the carpal tunnel is a space, that has an X amount of pressure, the median nerve is at risk if anything goes wrong in that carpal tunnel. Okay, so I wouldn't memorize all these ligaments here, but what I would know is that uh, what you have is this transverse carpal ligament or flexor retinaculum, which forms the roof of the carpal tunnel, and you've got these flexor tendons, which are tendons from flexor pollicis longus, uh, flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus, and that's nine altogether. Uh, and then you've got uh, you've got um, your median nerve as well. And this here would be your radial artery. But those are the nine structures that pass through the carpal tunnel. All right. And then I also want to just point out here briefly, and this is going to take on some importance later on, but before the median nerve passes through the carpal tunnel, it gives off a branch, uh, which is a cutaneous branch, a sensory branch, and this is called the pulmonary cutaneous branch of the median nerve. And this is going to be important uh, in a little bit. So just remember that right before the median nerve goes into the carpal tunnel, uh, it gives off a branch to the, uh, to the uh, lateral palmar hand. All right, so enough anatomy. So just, this is just the uh, sensory distribution of these nerves, but it roughly correlates to the motor distribution. Uh, so the, the uh, sensory distribution for the, uh, mostly we're concerned here about the median nerve because it's the median nerve uh, that is uh, at risk with uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. But uh, your radial nerve provides innervation, sensory innervation to the dorsal side of your hand as well as uh, parts of the side around your thumb. The median nerve provides innervation in the middle part of your hand as well as the palmar side of your thumb. And then the ulnar nerve is the, uh, the very medial side of, the, uh, of the, the fingers. So here you got your, the medial side of your ring finger and then your pinky and the medial side of your hand. So this is the area where you feel the numbness and tingling when you hit your funny bone. That's the ulnar nerve. Median nerve is in between that and the radial nerve. So these are going to be the areas that are going to be most affected. As far as motor distribution of the median nerve, what I really want to point out is that the median nerve supplies motor innervation, particularly towards this here, uh, the thenar eminence. Okay, so... Uh, what, okay, so carpal tunnel syndrome. What is the history of a patient with carpal tunnel syndrome? A lot of times we have a tendency to correlate carpal tunnel syndrome with repetitive wrist activity, uh, like desk work, um, typing, but no causative factor has been found. There is a correlation between those activities, but there's really no causative factor that we know to cause carpal tunnel syndrome. So that's kind of unresolved. Nevertheless, 
it's it's correlated. So I, I would know that carpal tunnel syndrome is commonly associated with desk work and repetitive movements of the wrist. Uh, so something you might see this in would be like secretaries or office workers. Women have a much higher likelihood to present than men, about five to ten times to one. So this is really significant. So this goes beyond the fact that maybe it's just women present more because they're more likely to be secretaries or office workers, whereas men are more likely to be police officers or something like that. This is a much greater significance. And what I believe uh, this is due to is because women tend to have narrower wrists than men. And if you have a narrower wrist, then that pushes your likelihood to get carpal tunnel syndrome way up because you don't have much room for error. It tends to present in middle-aged patients, 40s to 50s. We don't know why that is, but it can certainly also pre present in younger or older patients as well. And there's also a higher likelihood of carpal tunnel syndrome in pregnancy, and that's likely due to the fact that there's, uh, there's edema in pregnancy, just a slightly increased water volume in pregnancy, and that's normal. What are the symptoms? Well, the patient's going to present with numbness, paresthesias, uh, but most commonly pain because it's the pain that gets most patients to go into the clinic. Numbness and paresthesias maybe, but pain really gets the, gets the person up off their butt and, and into, into the doctor's office. So numbness, paresthesias, and pain. What's important is where is the pain? Now if this pain, numbness and paresthesias, is over the pinky and the ring finger, not carpal tunnel syndrome. Why? Because that's over an ulnar nerve distribution. Carpal tunnel syndrome affects the median nerve. And so in order to uh, be affecting the medial nerve, it's got to have medial nerve distribution. And so that's going to be the, uh, the lateral three and a half fingers, maybe with the exception of parts of the thumb, uh, but definitely the pointer finger and the uh, middle finger and then uh, also some weakness of the thumb, which can manifest as a, a weakness of gripping. So holding a bottle of water, holding uh, a can of something, holding uh, whatever you might hold. So uh, it's two things, both sensory and motor. So the sensory are numbness, paresthesias, and pain of the lateral hand, and, uh, and then weakness of the thumb. So the most salient feature is thenar muscle wasting, but you're not always going to see this in every carpal tunnel syndrome patient. This is going to be more in the patient who's been having this for a long time and hasn't really gotten any treatment for it. Remember that the median nerve gives motor innervation to your, uh, to your thenar muscles. And so if you have a problem with the median nerve and you've got less uh, less innervation into those muscles, then they're just going to uh, atrophy. And so you'd have thenar muscle wasting. But just because you don't have thenar muscle wasting on your physical exam doesn't mean the patient doesn't have carpal tunnel syndrome. So this is a very uh, specific but not a very sensitive uh, uh, diagnostic uh, test. The symptoms should be reproducible with two tests, and these two tests are Tinnell's tests and Phelan's test. So I want to show you what those are. First off, here's your uh, thenar wasting. So you can see here that you've got, if you look at your own hand, assuming you don't have carpal tunnel syndrome, you should see a nice meaty uh, thenar eminence, which would be right next to your thumb. Here you can see that there's kind of some loose skin showing that there used to be a big meaty muscle there and now it's atrophied. So this is bilateral thenar wasting. And usually in carpal tunnel syndrome patients, it'll only be in one side or the other. So it's not very common to have it in both, but it can. Okay, so this is Tinnell's test. And Tinnell's test 
I already remember, just Tinnels means tapping. And you can do Tinnels test for tarsal tunnel syndrome, and you can do Tinnels test for carpal tunnel syndrome. So what you do for Tinnels test is quite simple. You have the patient place their hand in the supinated position on the examination table, and you take uh, a, uh, I mean, I suppose you could use anything that taps at it, but you take your reflex hammer, and you just lightly percuss over the wrist. And what this should do is it should be placing stress. It should be placing, uh, it should be placing some kind of, uh, of excitement on the median nerve. And what that then does is it reproduces the symptoms. So the, the, the big problem that we have with carpal tunnel syndrome is an increased pressure in the carpal tunnel. So if you already have an increased pressure by percussing on the carpal tunnel, you're going to reproduce the symptoms. And so this patient should have uh, paresthesias, maybe pain in uh, this area of their hand. So another thing that increases the pressure of the carpal tunnel is flexion. And flexion simply does that because of how the bones get aligned. And so what we do with Phelan's test, Phelan's test is simply putting both hands into flexion, and then pushing them together. So what we have then is force flexion. You're forcing flexion because what you're doing is you're pushing the hands uh, further than they would normally go uh, if you were to just flex them by themselves. And so this should also cause pain or uh, paresthesias or numbness. And usually we have the patient uh, do this for about a minute to see if the symptoms come on. So what we're doing in both of these is we're trying to irritate the median nerve uh, or uh, either by directly compressing on it or by increasing the pressure in the, uh, in the carpal tunnel. Physical exam. So like I mentioned, the most salient feature, if you can see it, if you do see thenar muscle wasting, that is very, very specific for carpal tunnel syndrome. But not having it doesn't exclude carpal tunnel syndrome. Symptoms should be reproducible on physical examination. And what you would see is on Tennell's test, which is percussion of the tunnel, Tennell's means tap, uh, you would get a reproduction of symptoms, and Phelan's test, which is forced hyperflexion. Those are the two I just showed you. As far as diagnosis, the diagnosis is simply clinical. Unless you suspect any other kinds of injuries, you, can, uh, you don't need to do any other tests. If the most likely diagnosis is carpal tunnel syndrome and that indeed is uh, confirmed on physical examination, you can stop there. And the initial step in therapy is wrist splinting. And we hold the wrist in a slightly extended position. And that makes sense because what were we doing with Phelan's test? We were flexing the wrist and we were doing that to get a little bit of an elevated pressure in the carpal tunnel. And so holding the wrist in a slightly extended position relieves that pressure and allows for healing. So the best initial therapy for carpal tunnel syndrome is wrist splinting with the wrist in a slightly extended position. And this usually will need to be about three weeks of splinting, uh, but this works for the vast majority of patients. If, however, conservative management fails, then surgical management can be appropriate in consultation with an orthopedic surgeon. Before you send a patient off to get surgery, they are going to need an EMG, an electromyelogram. And this is done uh, to, check the, uh, to check the conduction of the median nerve to see the, uh, the extent of injury. But an EMG of the median nerve is a necessary step before, uh, before surgical steps are taken. So that's good to know for the USML. You can't just go straight into surgery. You have to get an EMG of the affected median nerve. And this is conservative management with the splinting. And so you can see this isn't going to keep a patient from working. It might be a pain in the butt. And of course, you can also give them anti-inflammatory agents for the pain. And then for surgical management, this can be done in two different ways. More recently, they've gone into the uh, endoscopic management, which... Uh, 
is better when I show you the uh, open approach you'll see why it's better uh, but uh, for median this is for median nerve release and all you're doing is you're going in and you're cutting the flexor retinaculum and what that does is it relieves the pressure of the uh, of the carpal tunnel uh, so you're going in on one side and on the other and then you're just cutting this flexor retinaculum Okay. Very important, though, I might add, to cut on the median side. And the reason I uh, bring this up, so, uh, sorry, to cut laterally, uh, cut towards the, uh, no, I'm sorry, cut towards the medial side. Uh, and the reason is because remember what I was telling you about that little nerve that comes off and goes to the thumb. You're going to want to cut on the opposite side of that. So uh, that's going to be... Uh, on the medial side. So you'd want to cut more over here uh, over here, and not here because there is a nerve that travels right along the flexor retinaculum that pr provides your sensory innervation to this part of your palm. So you'd want to cut on the opposite side. But that's, that's a common injury uh, that's uh, secondary to this kind of surgery. So, like I said, if you're going to go in and you're going to cut this, you want to cut on this side. You don't want to cut on this side. So here's an open surgery. And this is the healing. And the last thing I just want to bring up is that if you have a patient who truly has carpal tunnel syndrome, they should not have numbness on their uh, over their thenar eminence and the reason is because the affected part of the median nerve is distal to where that palmar cutaneous branch came off so they should not have any numbness uh, over their where their thenar eminence is or was if they do have numbness over the thenar eminence then you should consider possibly that they've got an entrapment of the median nerve somewhere else more proximal to the carpal tunnel. And if you have any questions, feel free to let me know.